from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. I'm Tomoko Steen at the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. Uh, today's speaker, we have a prominent speaker, and uh, this is a part of the celebration of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. So the co-sponsorship is Library of Congress Asian American Association. I'm also vice president for that uh, organization, and uh, this works very well. Uh, wonderful speaker, uh, Asian American, and uh, top of the uh, top speaker as uh, also the in the physics. Um, today's speaker, Dr. Gong Pin Ye, am I pronouncing okay? Um, is a world-renowned high-energy physicist. Uh, his lecture today, World Energy Transformation, Asia and Beyond, will talk about sustainable energy and improving energy efficiencies. So Dr. Ye is, has been the high energy physicist at Fermi National Lab, and uh, he has been there since 1985. So he has been doing a very uh, prominent research there as well, as he's a member of the Academia Sinica. And uh, he, he's running around the world explaining his research while doing research at the same time. I'm not sure how he managed it. Um, he has done undergraduate degree at MIT and also a master's degree at the Caltech and also PhD at MIT under Nobel laureate uh, Jerome Friedman. Uh, Dr. Friedman is really pioneering American uh, physicist as well and uh, uh, we are lucky to have the uh, Dr. Ye, possibly future Nobel laureate, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting talk. Uh, beyond his you know physics background, energy, so he covers biofuel to solar energy, to uh, wind, variety of the energy, and uh, he is going to talk about the how we solve this energy crisis. So before further ado, please join me welcoming Dr. Ye. Good morning. And uh, thank you for the great honor and special privilege of uh, sharing with you today uh, one of our greatest moments in human history. We are transforming the world energy to uh, sustainable energy forever. So this is a really a special moment of human history. The 21st century is the century of sustainable energy. It's the greatest human challenge and the greatest human opportunity and endeavor. The world energy consumption is 15,000 gigawatts or 15,000 billion watts. Giga means billion. That's because we have 7 billion people on Earth on our blue planet and uh, Wait a minute. This uh, is not working all of a sudden. The forward isn't working. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, now. Okay, now let, let me go back. Okay. So, because of this 15,000 gigawatts, that means uh, we burn 10 billion tons of carbon every year. 
7 billion people, 10 billion tons of carbon every year. What does that mean? It means 1 million tons every single hour of carbon, or equivalently 4 million tons of CO2 every single hour. Now, that was simple arithmetic. Now, detailed scientific studies show the same result. It's 10 billion tons every year, or 1.1 million tons every single hour. This is the cube of uh, 100 meters on each side, and that's a million tons of uh, carbon, okay? A, a million tons of coal, or a million tons of oil, or a million tons of water. Now, 100 meters is uh, the length of a football field plus an end zone. So imagine the length of a football field plus an end zone long, the length of a football field plus an end zone wide, and the length of a football field plus an end zone deep of oil or coal, and we burn that every single hour. We are here one hour, humans will have burned another million tons of carbon. The carbon comes from coal and oil, gas, and other things. And um, at this moment, China is responsible for 27%, U.S. 15%. Okay, so to solve the world energy challenge, we also have to solve the energy challenges in China and India and U.S. and every country worldwide. The Green Pope actually is a Pope Benedict, and he approved and uh, have installed on the in the Vatican City, solar panels on one of the buildings. And Pope Francis says, we need to care for our common home. Okay. So our uh, Pope leaders are saying, we, we really need to solve this problem. And uh, recently, the uh, agreement in Paris says every country should reduce CO2 emissions. That's the promise. Every country should reduce CO2 emissions. The renewable energy percentage, EU has a goal of 20% uh, by 2020. Well, by 2015, they already a a achieved 15%. Uh, this is EU. So that's good. And the US is about 10%. It's about so that's what we should do. At least have 20% from renewable energies by 2020, and then we can do 50% uh, by 2050. So in this way, we will solve the world energy challenge. So what we should do is um, as much renewable energies as possible, wind, solar, biofuels, ocean, they're all good. And improve energy efficiency is also important. For anybody or any country that wants to use nuclear power, nuclear power needs fundamental changes. Energy fuels development. So where there's, it's dark, where it's dark means they have no electricity. Where it's developed, there's electricity and it's all lit up at night. So. 1.3 billion people on Earth have no electricity. So about 600 million people in Africa and uh, five, 600 million people in Southeast Asia have no electricity. If we help them get in, uh, re, uh, electricity, we'll completely help the world, help Africa and Southeast Asia, and we help the world. And the good news is we can do this in the next 10, 20 years. We will do this in the next 10, 20 years. This is an IEA study that shows about half of Africa have no electricity. It's a challenge, but it's also a great moment for Africa. We, we will do this in the next 10, 20 years. It, 
Kofi Annan also says um, in the, in the uh, Africa Progress Report that by providing electricity, we will help Africa and the world. The United Nations and the World Bank also um, strongly say that we need to provide sustainable energy to everybody on Earth by 2030 or so. We want to thank the U.S. government, the President, the Congress for recently um, having this, passed this Electrify Africa uh, project. It will help 50 million people in Africa have electricity for the first time in the next five years. It's wonderful, thanks to our government. The IEA says in, by 2035, in the next 20 years or so, the world really should spend about $2 trillion per year on new energy. Now, with new technology, we can reduce this number, so don't be scared by the $2 trillion. However, if anybody who just wants to make money, that means it's the greatest opportunity, right? $2 trillion per year. Actually, the world now, in the last few years, we have been able to invest about $300 billion every year on new energy, uh, renewable energy, actually. Okay? So it's a great business opportunity as well. China invested about $100 billion, U.S. about 50, India 5, okay, uh, India 10, sorry, and Africa 5. It also means jobs. Uh, this last, in 2014, there were 7.7 .7 million jobs related to renewable energies. In the U.S. alone was 724,000 jobs. Even Saudi Arabia, Arabia says by 2050, only about 15% of their energy will be from fossil. And it's new fossil because the known ones will have been used up. It will be new fossil, 15% of the energy. The rest, 85%, will come from some kind of nuclear and solar and wind. This is Saudi Arabia. Now, just uh, last month, Saudi Arabia announced, the king announced the new Saudi Vision 2030. And they want to, and they need to transform Saudi Arabia economy away from the dependence on oil. The International Renewable Energy Agency headquarter is in Abu Dhabi. Now that's very really interesting. The International Renewable Energy Agency headquarter is in the oil country. Okay, according to IRENA, uh, the world renewable energy capacity now is about 2,000 gigawatts. Of the 15,000 that we consume, 2,000 now is from renewable energies, or at least the capacity is. So hydro is most of it, but wind and solar are coming up. In last year alone, the world installed 35 gigawatts of hydro and 63 gigawatts of wind and 47 gigawatts of solar in one year alone. That's probably equivalent to uh, elect electricity from 50 new nuclear power plants. So from the renewables now, every year we can add equivalent to 50 new nuclear reactors of electricity. So the world uh, wind power capacity now is 430 gigawatts, and it can, we can add 50, 60 gigawatts per year easily. Okay, so last, last year the world added 63 gigawatts. And uh, China alone ad added 32 gigawatts. About half of the world's wind power was added last year was in China. Uh, some other countries uh, could, could add a lot more. Much more. The U.S. did pretty well also. The U.S. added 8.6 gigawatts. Okay, this is the total in uh, 
In China, wind, total wind power capacity in China is 145 gigawatts, and in the U.S., 75 gigawatts. So this is the distribution. So China is, uh, Asia is doing well, but it's uh, mostly in China. Uh, the rest of Asia could do much more. And U.S. is doing well. <coughs> Solar energy, if we cover 1% of the world's land with solar panels, it could provide 30,000 gigawatts, twice the amount of energy consumed by humans. Okay? So uh, this is in Japan. And when I fly between Tokyo and Taipei, I see this uh, outside. <laughs> this was built in one year. 70 megawatts by one company in one, in one year, you can build this. Actually, uh, many stadiums in the world, including the US, have uh, solar panels on top. And this one is in Taiwan, and it's, it's powered 100% 100 by solar panels. And when the stadium is not being used, the electricity can be used uh, put onto the grid. S sports stadiums are a good place to put solar panels. Okay, so the solar power is expected to grow quickly in the next five years in many countries. By, 20, by 2020, the world should have about 500 gigawatts of solar panels. So China is adding a lot of uh, solar panels. So it's uh, China, uh, US, Japan, India, lots of. Actually, an easier way is just solar hot water. And even in uh, Minnesota, they have uh, solar hot water on, in the downtown St. Paul. OK? The easiest way to have to use solar energy is just solar hot water. It's more efficient. It's about 50% efficient. So the world has 400 gigawatts of solar thermal heating. China alone in 2015 added 14.9 uh, gigawatts of hydro, 32 gigawatts of wind, so, uh, 18 gigawatts of solar. So actually, China is now the world leader of renewable energies. Unfortunately, uh, China also added 6 gigawatts of nuclear power and 71 gigawatts of coal. Oh, we, we, need to, we need to change that one. Japan, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi put into law that uh, it's called cool biz. So when you go to Japan, uh, June to September, you don't have to wear a suit. So they raise the uh, temperature a little bit. Just by that alone, they save electricity 1% in Japan. Now, after March 11th, the uh, 54 reactors is reduced, well, they were shut down, and now only two are operating. And the Kubis became super Kubis. Now, from May until October 31st, when you go to Japan, you don't have to wear a suit by law. OK, now, also in the last three years, Japan added 27 gigawatts of solar. And then uh, Japan's in the process of uh, electricity deregulation. So that's great, the open market instead of uh, just monopolies. And Japan has tremendous, uh, has good uh, wind power potential as well. Uh, Japan should be able to add tens of gigawatts of wind power. For example, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan all have tremendous offshore wind power potential. And these countries sh should use offshore wind power as soon as possible. Uh, Taiwan. The people of Taiwan just elected a new president, a new Congress. And it actually is the Green Party. So Taiwan, uh, starting May 20th, is going to greatly change Taiwan's energy policies. That's great. 
South Korea also has a uh, national statement policy to achieve 11% by 2035 of uh, energy coming from renewables. Um, we should be able to do better than this. With new technology and uh, some thinking, we should be able to do better than 11%. Even in the Southeast Asia, there have been discussion of towards low carbon by 2050 in Asia Pacific. Now, IEA study announced last year, it says, if we just do business as usual, this is what it's going to look like. So although the renewables is increasing, uh, gas, oil, and coal increase even more. But this is, this is business as usual, and I don't, I'm sure that we're not going to be doing business as usual, so this will be changed. For example, Southeast Asia also has lots of sun, especially in the dry season. They should just be using solar, okay? So for all, those, all of you that are from Southeast Asia, please tell them to use uh, solar. And there are other things that can come. For example, the Pacific Island nations, until recently, they only had small amount of renewables. But because they, they heard about, hey, wait a minute, the, the solar power is so good now, so they are completely changing to renewables. All the uh, Pacific Island countries. In Hawaii, Hawaii says they're going to have 100% of their energy from renewables by 2045, or 70% by 2030. Until a few years ago, 98% of Hawaii's energy was imported oil. Okay, so Hawaii is completely changing. It's wonderful. It's going to be clean Hawaii. And Okinawa and Hawaii are very close. They have a very close relationship. And recently, thanks to Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, uh, the agreement between Hawaii and Okinawa is extended. So that's great. As most people know, as, uh, for lighting, we should just switch to LEDs because LEDs are at least five times more efficient than incandescent lights. So we should all change to LEDs as much as possible. Saves electricity and it's brighter. And the, our administration, our leaders, uh, push for doubling the fuel efficiency of uh, cars, and that's great. The more we do, the better. In the U.S., there are 764 companies or governments or organizations that are already 100% powered by renewable energies, including Intel, Microsoft, Apple, City of Dallas, and the City of Washington, D.C. And the uh, NHL, NHL buys its, its electricity 100% renewable energy credit. And Carnegie Mellon University, for example. See, so if you want to do it, you can. You can have your electricity 100% from renewables now. Maybe the Library of Congress can be 100% powered by it. <laughs> OK. So uh, U.S. added 75 gigawatts of wind power last year. We can easily do this again. Oh, the, sorry, the total is 75 gigawatts. Uh, the, cent the Midwest has tremendous wind power potentials. And the, uh, this is the wind capacity. Actually, Texas has 17 gigawatts in wind power. Texas is the leader of wind power in the U.S. In, as far as the amount installed. But Iowa, the small state, actually uh, has the most wind power per capita. So 31% of Iowa's electricity last year came from wind power. Okay? But the U.S., even including Iowa, 
we have only installed 1% of our potential. So wind power can, in the U.S. can be much more. We probably could be, the U.S. probably could be powered by wind power alone. The former Secretary of Interior says, the wind power of the East Coast offshore could replace most of the coal that we use, just the offshore alone. Now, when we talk about renewable energies, there's always a question about the electricity storage. Well, there are several ways. For example, you can use battery, or you can use uh, renewable energy to make hydrogen, or you can use uh, pump hydro. You pump up the water into a higher level, and then when you need it, you use the water. Okay? So, for example, this is a, just using battery in Ohio. It's 40 megawatts. Hmm? It's doable. You can store electricity if you want it. Uh, so, Tesla is spending, investing $5 billion in this new gigafactory to make batteries. Okay? By doing so, the more the world produces batteries, the, the lower the price it will come. So this is the projection. Right now it's more expensive, but uh, the more we use it, the lower the price it will be. Okay, so batteries is one of the solutions. Another one is to use wind or solar power to make uh, hydrogen. So National Renewable Energy Lab is uh, studying this. But actually, it's already done in Germany. This is using wind power to make hydrogen. And then you can use hydrogen whichever way you want. The U.S. has uh, also tremendous solar power potential. Again, this is uh, downtown Minnesota, convention center on top of conventions. Actually, on top of convention centers are great places for solar panels. So Orlando Convention Center also has megawatt of uh, solar power. Or airports, even airports are great places for putting solar panels. The U.S. military is actually the leader, a leader of renewable energies in the U.S. Okay? It's better to use solar panels than uh, deliver fuel, for example. Actually, U.S. military also has this uh, net zero policy for U.S. bases. The U.S. military would like U.S. military bases to be independent of, uh, to be energy independent. So we all know that the solar panels have been coming down in price dramatically every year. So in the last year, the new installations of energy in the U.S., 39% is actually wind power, and about 29% was gas, and 29% was solar. Last year, the new energy added was about one-third each wind solar and gas. No other sources. Okay, so the, this is the uh, U.S. solar in installations. Because the price is going down, so you see the quick rise of solar power in the U.S. also. But it's a quick rise of solar power worldwide, actually, okay, because the price keep coming down. And this is the ranking of uh, solar power by state. California is by far the leader. About half of the U.S. solar power is now in California. Amazingly, North Carolina and Massachusetts are also among the top. Now, the uh, Sunshine State, if the Sunshine State use more solar power, they can save billions every year. and also New Mexico. Another great place to put solar panels and the uh, solar charging is just parking lots. <laughs> okay, all, all parking lots pretty much uh, are potential for great places for installing solar power and electrical charging. 
and some dealers even provide free solar charging. Now, FedEx, UPS, DHL all have electric trucks for delivery. The U.S. Post, Postal Service seems to be a great place, great uh, to have the U.S. You know, postal trucks uh, electric. That could be powered by the sun or the wind. They, they don't go very far every day. Okay? So it's easy to charge them. Yeah. So U.S. postal trucks should really all be electric, I think. Also, school buses. They don't go very far either every day. So most of them just sitting around and travel a short distance every day. Perfect for using electric. Actually, all transportation could be electric. <laughs> buses, boats, golf carts, ideal. The U.S. has already more than 30,000 charging stations, and there are apps or on the inter internet web, you can find out where the charging stations are. And actually, I think uh, smart cars should all have them on the board, on dashboard, and it will just tell you, hey, uh, you are 20% remaining in electricity, you should take a turn right and go get charged up. So actually, charging up electric cars is also not a problem now. Uh, in Estonia, for example, they have uh, a couple hundred fast charging stations. So you can just charge it up, and it's 100% renewable. 90% of it is just from the wind. Okay, and this, is, this is, has happened in many countries. Also, uh, Netherlands and Germany even, where there's not really much sun actually, but they have a lot of solar power. For example, a small startup company in Chicago is installing 3,000 solar charging stations in Jordan. We are exporting to other countries. <laughs> now, there's another thing called uh, supercapacitors, and it works like lightning. You want to, you, if when you want to charge the electric uh, vehicles, you want it to charge it fast, right? You don't want it to take too long. So you want some fast way of charging it. Well, uh, capacitors charge and discharge very fast, like lightning. But you need large areas to do this. So they use nanomaterial to have a uh, huge surface. So a small amount, a, a gram of uh, nanomaterial has a surface of a football field. So then you can have electric buses charged up at one bus station in 30 seconds, and enough electricity to go another couple bus stops. So it goes to one and next bus stop, it gets charged up again in 30 seconds. It goes to another stop, it gets charged up again in 30 seconds. So you can charge your uh, buses this way as well, all electric. And Korea is uh, making progress in this. And also, there are also some electric buses in Italy and other countries. Biofuels, uh, there's wood pellets. Uh, some countries use it, and it's good. It's at least close to carbon neutral. So it's also fast growing. Bio, uh, ethanol and biodiesel are also growing. And recently, just in the recently, in the last years, now you can make uh, ethanol from cellulosic ethanol, from grass or corn stover. So you don't have to make it from food. You don't want to make it from food. In fact, uh, United Airlines and others have already started using bio jet fuel. Okay, and this has been tested by Boeing, Airbus, uh, military, so in the future, when we need more jet fuel, we can use bio jet fuel. For hydro, hydro is actually good if you do it right. Don't hurt the uh, environment, but then you can provide constant 
electricity. So hydro is actually good if you do it right. So the world is also building uh, hydro, and it's good, for example, for Africa as well, and South America. This one shows the cost of electricity, 2010 and 2014. And you see that the price is coming down even between 2010 and 2014. And wind power, hydro, geo, bio, they are already at the level or cheaper than coal. <coughs> the lowest price electricity in the US now is actually wind power. So the percentage of uh, world electricity, about 22% is from renewables now, of which about 4%, about 4 of the world's electricity now is from wind, and only about 1% is from the solar, but it's growing. Those are growing. There's also uh, ocean energy in various forms, in waves, uh, currents. Okay, so remember the energy is proportional to the density, and the water density is about it's about 80, 800 times air density. So even a small turbine can, in the water can p provide you lots of electricity. Regarding nuclear power, we all know about the uh, nuclear crisis. There are about 400 reactors in the world, and they provide 336 gigawatts, which is about 10.8 or 11 percent of the world's electricity. So the 400 reactors in the world provide about 11 percent of the world's electricity. That means the 400 reactors in the world provide 2.6% of the world's energy. So all the reactors in the world reduce carbon emissions by 2.6%. If we turn them all off, the carbon emissions will go up by 2.6%. This shows the startup and the shutdown of nuclear reactors in the world. The average age of all reactors in the world is 29 years, and the average age of the 99 reactors in the U.S. is 35. They are designed for 40 years. So it is expected that the number of reactors in the world will go down in the next 10, 20 years. In the next 10 years, about 100 will be uh, decommissioned. In the next 20 years, about 200 will be decommissioned. The single place that's increasing the number of sol uh, nuclear reactors is China. So nuclear power has five fundament fundamental challenges. Safety, nuclear waste, weapons proliferation, the cost, and sustainability. As I said earlier, w the world should use as much renewable energy as possible, but uh, the nuclear power, if anybody wants to use it, it has to be changed. This is a molten salt reactor. It was done in Oak Ridge National Lab in the 60s, actually also 50s. Use the liquid instead of solid fuel. So you, you can drain the liquid if anything happens, or you can just put a small amount of liquid in there at a time. So you reduce the probability of nuclear problem, uh, safety problem. And also if you use thorium, thorium doesn't use anything, uh, doesn't do anything by itself. You have to give it neutrons for the process to go. To use thorium as en for energy, you have to provide the neutrons. You can stop the neutrons and then the process will stop. So it's safe. You can have, if we want to use more nuclear power, we have to make sure it's 100% safe. There's a study in Japan that shows that if Fukushima were using thorium instead of uranium, there would have been no other problems except some heat to get rid of. You wouldn't have the radiation problem, you wouldn't have the explosion, 
you won't have any of these problems. Also, because it's element 90 instead of 92, okay, it's more, it's more difficult to make bombs. You could still do it, but, you, but it's more difficult to make bombs. And if you make bomb with it, it'll be more detectable because there'll be some uranium-232 there and it'll give you signals. You'll give that, that uh, people are trying to make bombs. And because it's element 90, the nuclear waste amount will be 10,000 times smaller. So instead of 10 tons, you get a kilogram. And the half-life of that is about hundreds of years instead of millions of or hundreds of thousands of years. So you also have much less uh, manageable nuclear waste problem just by doing, just by switching to a thorium. So because it's also a form of nuclear energy, so a handful of it has the same energy as 230 train cars of coal. A small amount of thorium can provide the same energy as 230 train cars of coal. So it has a lot of energy. And the world can already can uh, have six, seven million tons of thorium at a very low price. So there's a tremendous amount of thorium available worldwide. So if, you, if we switch to thorium, we can s provide the world energy for thousands of years safely and uh, very little nuclear waste and the less problem of the nuclear weapons. Now, so China wants this, and uh, they know that uh, they need technical assistance, so they actually asked the U.S. to help. So the U.S. is actually partnering with China on this uh, molten salt and uh, thorium energy technologies. India says, hey, we have lots of thorium. We should switch to thorium power as well. So actually, India already has designed, complete design of a thorium reactor. And actually, in the US, there are a whole bunch of uh, companies that are doing art development for molten salt reactors and uh, thorium energy. So UK, a few months ago, announced they're investing 250 million pounds over the next five years to develop advanced or new type of reactor. And the US DOE also in the last few months in announced the US is also investing into uh, two companies to develop this new reactor in the next few years. In fact, the US DOE also established a new department or agency to help bring about this new technology faster. Yes? On your previous slide, it mentions pebble bed. Yes. Is that as a different compared to molten salt? It's a different form of, uh, uh, it's, it's pebbles. It's different from, uh, the question is, is pebble bed different from the molten salt? Yes, it is. The molten salt is liquid, and the pebble bed is the little pebbles. But it's, it's uh, some uranium and then, then some uh, thorium together. Blanket. Okay. Now, thorium. Okay. Um, the neutron cross-sections, or the probability of thorium doing something, uh, is varies according to the energy of the neutrons that we give it. Most reactors operate in the lower energy region, and it's, this is what it is. Okay? The nuclear reactors operate in this lower energy region, actually. But if you go to a higher, slightly higher energy, then you can actually break apart, called fission, real fission, break apart the nucleus. Actually, it's typical of all heavy elements. In the lower energy region, <coughs> the reactors operate in here. But to th for thorium, 
and the uranium 238, if you go to uh, high energies, you can do the complete fission, break up the nucleus. Now, this may sound a little complicated, but I'll explain it to you. It's very easy. So, Europe has a project to say, let's use an accelerator to produce the neutrons and to have thorium energy or other things. Well, in fact, the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab already has a uh, accelerator that, that's pretty good. We, we need to make it more intense, but it's pretty good. And this Oak Ridge has been using this accelerator for some time. Europe is building a new accelerator as we speak right now. <clears throat> okay, so this is their schedule. It will be done in the next few years. And China also has a plan to build an accelerator-driven system, and India also. And Russia says, hey, we have an old accelerator. We can convert it. So you see, several countries uh, want to do this. In fact, in the US, uh, the DOE is sponsored, and uh, there's a <coughs> statement Accelerators for America's future. Accelerators can shrink tumors, produce clean energy, and reduce nuclear waste. Now, in the U.S., we actually uh, invented the uh, using protons or heavy ions to treat tumors, also uh, neutron therapy. Okay. This was built by Fermilab, and this was at Fermilab. So this is neutron therapy, for example, tumors, and you just shoot neutrons at it and destroy the nucleus of the tumor cells, and you cure the person. Okay, this is a large tumor here. These are hand. This is a hand. So this is a huge tumor, and you just shoot neutrons at it uh, two minutes a day, three times a week, and four weeks later, you cure the person. So it's neutron therapy. Use neutrons to break up the nucleus. Well, neutron therapy can solve the nuclear problem. When we use the nuclear reactors, these are the waste, the high-level nuclear waste. And if you don't treat it, if you just bury it underground, it can last for millions of years. This will be the radiation for a million, de million years if you just bury it underground, if you don't actually treat it. Even the former Energy Secretary Stephen Chu said nobody has really uh, solved the nuclear waste problem. Well, we actually could do it. <clears throat> now, this I, sh I showed you earlier that if you have MeV neutrons or 10, 10, 20 MeV neutrons, you can break up the nucleus of heavy elements. The ordinary reactors operate in this range, but there's a type of reactor that's been talked about and de being developed. It's called fast reactors. They operate this range. But if, if you use the accelerator to, to provide the neutrons, it's even higher, so it's even better. And you can absolutely control it. You can turn it off anytime you want. So absolute safety. So there, was, there has been U.S. studies also that says you can transmute nuclear waste. These are uh, fission products. You can actually break them apart. And this is just using the fast reactors. If you use the accelerator system, you'll be even better. In Japan, they have studied this. See, again, use an accelerator, and this is nuclear f waste. You can use nuclear waste as fuel to produ produce electricity, at the same time destroy the nuclear waste. So Japan estimates they need about four of these systems because they have 40 reactors now. Okay, And you can shorten the half-life of nuclear waste 
from millions of years to thousand or hundred or even fifteen years. If you use the neutrons to break up the nuclear waste. The European study also says if you use the accelerator, provide new fast neutrons, you can reduce the amount of nuclear waste and you can shorten the half life of the nuclear waste. So because of our development in the accelerators, now we can have this accelerator. We can build it now. It's available. We can, if we just build this accelerator, we can take care of these problems. The technology we have now. Okay, so we can, we can, and we will solve the world energy challenge. Do renewable energies as much as possible, improve energy efficiencies, and if anybody wants or any country wants to use nuclear power, we need to change nuclear power fundamentally, totally. By doing this, we can have 20% of the world energy coming from renewables by 2020, 30% by 2030, and more than 50% by 2050. We will transform the world energy in the next decades. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Is the concept of energy from fusion, is that considered a dead end? Now? So the question is, is the concept of fusion as uh, energy, is it, uh, what's the status? Well, uh, the experts of fusion says it's probably 50 years away. So we can't wait that long. We will solve the world energy challenges by then. Yes. What about hydrogen? The hydrogen, we've been talking about that as well for decades. And the thing is to deploy it, well, you need uh, hydrogen stations. You need hundreds of thousands of these hydrogen stations. So it's coming along, Japan especially, has been promoting uh, hydrogen, but it's going to take uh, decades when it comes. It's one of the forms. I showed you earlier that you can use wind power and solar power to produce hydrogen. Then that's absolutely clean. If you just get the hydrogen from natural gas, it's not all that clean, right? You're still using natural gas. But, but you could do that uh, using solar power and wind power to make the hydrogen. So it's, it's coming, but it'll It'll be one of, the, one of the solutions. Yes. I want to say that sometimes we go to the beach by Ocean City and so along the highway. This summer, for the first time, I saw a solar installation that I think is maybe 40 or 60 acres. Uh -huh. And to think of that in Maryland yes. was just a different thing for me. I yes. think of Arizona yes. and California, yes. but to see that in Maryland, it really was a real thing that was happening that was different to me yes. this year. Yes, yes. Thank you. So the, your statement is that uh, it's nice to see um, solar panels even in Maryland. Right. Yeah, yes. Now, um, when I show that even the Washington, D.C., we use, uh, uh, the government of Washington, D.C. use a lot of uh, uh, wind power. And solar power, actually, the entire, almost the entire U.S. has good potentials for solar power, okay? So in the list that I show you, Massachusetts has uses more solar power than Florida. <laughs> so, so really, uh, we need to get Florida to use solar power. It can save for Florida billions of dollars every year. Instead of buying coal or buying other form, or oil, other energies, Florida can save billions of dollars by switching to solar power. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, in your presentation, you discussed briefly about how you might be able to 
take care of energy needs in Africa yes. within 10, 20 years or so. Yes. Now, similar um, issues are also relevant in South Asia, where yes. high proportions of families rely on solid fuel yes. for cooking. Yes, yes. They're looking at over billions yes. uh, of populations that rely on solid fuel for cooking. Yes. Um, and I mean, oh, they're dying to get move to, to solid, clean energy, yes. where it's easier uh, yes. for, to take care of their energy needs. Can you uh, say a little more about your thought on how you might be able to take care in Africa and as well as in South Asia? Okay. And the needs are for solid fuel for cooking. I'm looking at women's, uh, uh, the, the resources that women have to put together. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the question and comment is uh, we can potentially help Africa and Southeast Asia, South Asia. South Asia move to uh, renewable energy, especially solar, uh, in the next 10, 20 years. So um, how, how best to do this, right? Yes. So as I said earlier, that the uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, about 600 million people in Africa and about five, 600 million people in Asia and India have no electricity and they burn solid fuels. Okay. So what we need to do is to, to t let people know, let the government and the people in South Asia and Africa, Africa has so much sun, okay, or the Silk Road countries, the Middle East, those uh, uh, Central Asia countries also, so many countries in the world, including South Asia, they have so much solar power potential. And it's probably because they don't know about it or they don't know how to finance it that, that's slowing them down. So there are the different models to finance this. You know, uh, Solar City. Solar City is a great example. In the U.S., when, when, when people say, oh, uh, solar panels are too expensive, they say, well, you don't have to buy it. Just lease it. Let me just put solar panels on top of your roof, okay? And then uh, 10 years from now, it's yours. And you pay electricity lower than what you pay now. We'll, we'll put solar panels on top of your roof. You pay electricity lower than what you pay now. And then 10 years from now, the system is yours. You, you get electricity for free. So we need to explain to people different models of in adding renewables. Most people in the world don't know, and even, even the governments don't know, and they don't know how to do it, or they don't. Sometimes they need uh, some help also, but, but we can do it. We'll do it in the next 10, 20 years. Any other questions? I, I have one question. Yes. The, could you tell me um, the cost differences between the accelerator small uh, nuclear reactor and the big nuclear Okay, so for the small ones, if you want just 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts, you don't need an accelerator to do that. You don't want it because the accelerator costs them, okay? So, so for small ones, just do, just do uh, molten salt or switching to, uh, to thorium, okay? There, you need to reprocess to get the neutrons to continue. So for those small ones, you need the reprocessing. For the accelerator one, you don't need the reprocessing. You can just, you, you now have the neutrons anytime you want. So you don't need the reprocessing, okay? So that's the beauty of the accelerators. But it, for the accelerators, it's better for large scale, like the gigawatt scale. So for the large reactors, large system, use the accelerators. But for the small ones, all over the place, all over the world, you use uh, molten salt, thorium. Mm -hmm. You still have a little bit of waste, and you need reprocessing to get the neutrons. That's all. Cost-wise, You want me to give you a cost? Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, is this recorded? <laughs> okay, now, uh, because you're now doing a much safer system, I would say absolutely safe system, mm -hmm. so you don't need five different layers of safety protections. So the cost is actually lower than your nuclear reactors now. 
So the average cost of a new a gigawatt reactor now in the world is about five, six billion dollars. If you use, change to the new system, maybe two, three billion. You actually lower the cost. Yes. Uh, just to clarify, are you saying that a thorium reactor has less stringent shielding requirements? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, it's safe. You wanted to make sure I understood. Yes, <laughs> it's it's safe and it's less waste. So you don't need all those extra five layers of protection that are not even not good enough. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's safe and it solves those five. We need, for nuclear power, we need to solve those five challenges. Mm -hmm. Safety, nuclear waste, weapons, cost, and sustainability. We want, we want to be able to use it for thousands of years, not 100 years. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Ye. Could we a hand of applause for him? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.